Uh, and some more time. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you should have this on the table. Thank you very much for. Well, it's a pleasure. For the water. For the water. For the water. <laughs> water is life, huh? <laughs> well, water is life. Yeah. And right. what a great start. Uh, uh, thank you for the water yeah, and yeah. this incredible story that you have written for this project is all about water. Yeah. Is it not? Is it? Actually, it's about water. Yeah. <laughs> uh, rain and the water and, and environment and uh, yeah. And it is, you, you are in a city. Let me just move this microphone a little closer. Can you hear me? Yeah. Right. We need it really right close, yeah. like that. Yeah. Let's. So, this story, uh, Nyambura, the multicolored bird and the rainbow, yeah. uh, and Gugi, is about rain. Yeah. This is a city of rain. Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. Actually, you know, I've been here before. I have been here before. Actually, I was here before him. I just discovered. Huh? You were here in uh, oh, 19... I paved the way for you. You paved... <laughs> <laughs> when did we, before I, was, I introduced you... I was here in 1983, and I just came in. Uh, where, uh, Rodney, where is Rodney? He gave me this leaflet, uh, which uh, uh, is a collector's item by now, because there are only two of them, <laughs> programs when I was here in 1983. But I couldn't, I didn't remember, so, he, so thank you very much Rodney for reminding me of my previous uh, visit to Manchester, yeah. Yeah. But it is in the, a city of rain. It is a city came, of rain. Two days ago, or whatever, when I, I came from Edinburgh, and there was plenty of rain. Yes, yes. yes. Manchester is, is known for its rain, and the story that Ngugi has written for uh, this project is about a, a young... Well, you could explain for... Actually, can we start again? Yeah. We are going to start again. I'm going to give you the introduction that you deserve, okay, okay. and then we shall talk about the story that you have written for this project so that you can be, oh. you can be in the picture. Because otherwise, because I love this man, uh. and... My first book was published when I was 21, and The Barrel of the Pen, which was written by you, was a book which meant a lot to me at that time. And Gugi, you've been writing for over 50 years. There are different people from different generations who will have oh. their, their introductory moment into uh. world literature uh. through you. You, Chinua Achebe, uh, Wally Shoyinke, are part of a canon of great writers that have influenced the world. However, of all the writers that are here, um, only one of them, I believe, has been imprisoned for what he thinks, and that is you. Actually, yeah, for some, let me remind the audience that he and I last met in uh, a place called Parati, a small town in Brazil, some years ago, That's where right. we had a similar uh, conversation. <laughs> uh, so it's wonderful to Absolutely. see you again, actually, actually, yeah. That was the Literature Festival in Brazil. In, in Brazil, it was really, yeah. Many great writers yeah. there, and I saw you, because yeah. yeah. you look like me, and yeah. I, saw, I saw you yeah. at, at a very posh drinks do yeah. with a swimming pool yeah. and great yeah. hors d'oeuvres. And I saw Ngugi in the distance, and it just gently pattering, yeah. uh, pootering through the crowd, <laughs> and I made a beeline for you, and we went and sat yeah, down, yes, and we chatted, yeah. and we laughed. Yeah. Um, and Parati was built by enslaved Africans in about right. one of the earliest sit towns in Brazil, built by enslaved you know, uh, Africans. Yeah. Right. And the, the story of enslavement is, is at, in, in many ways, is at the heart of your story, in that you were born into a, Colonial. effectively, a, uh, a prison, essentially, that is what colonialism was. Yeah, you, you know, you know we, colonialism was like, uh, 
domestic slavery, you know, because enslavement of Africans meant taking them away from the continent yes. to all over. And as we know, there's no, apart from Brazil, even European cities, you know, there's no modern European city uh, who's, where, where, or in whose veins African blood does not run through. Yeah. yeah. Think of any, you know, think of London, Bristol, Manchester, Liverpool, you know, yeah. uh, think of Bordeaux, Paris, and so Venice even, yeah? And uh, there, the history is a history of uh, uh, modernity built on enslaved African labor. So being born into that at seven years of age, uh, the Mau Mau Rebellion uh, began. Yeah, I was born in 1938. Uh, yes, before, <laughs> many years before you were born. <laughs> but, because she told me that when I came in 1983 in Manchester, she was not yet born. Huh? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I was born in 1938 on the eve of the Second World War, right? Yes. In and Kenya. In Kenya. And Kenya was a British settler colony from about 1895 to 1903. But by then when I was born, so I was born into a settler colony. And for those who, who may not know, particularly the younger generation, there were two types of colonies in Africa and indeed in the world. There's a settler colony where Europeans or people from outside come and settle on your land, so to speak. And we've got very many good examples of settler colonies, say like America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, you know, uh, in Africa, we think of Kenya, uh, Zimbabwe, you know, uh, South Africa, Algeria, you know. That was one type. That type of colony is what I like to call protectorate type, where there were still colonies, but their land was never an issue because there was no settlement, yeah. like Uganda, Nigeria, and Ghana, you know. So Kenya was the settler type. And what's very interesting about the settler type of colony, that every single independence, the land was always an issue yep. in all those countries. Yep. And independence was won through armed struggle. Yeah. Yeah. So Mau Mau in Kenya was part of the armed struggle in Kenya that wrested independence from uh, Britain. Yeah. And let us talk about not only the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, la the land grab, the physical land grab. Let us also speak of the mental and spiritual uh, um, ownership of, of the land, of the yeah. mind, yeah. and of language in particular. Yeah. The, 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 yeah. I've always said that economic control anywhere uh, is incomplete without political control, and economic and political control are never really complete without mental control. And through cultural engineering, and cultural engineering involves also language is at the center of that cultural engineering, you know. But cultural engineering is part of the colonial process or for that matter, any process of domination, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you, co in a way, if you control somebody's mind, either individually or collectively, mm. you control a conception of who they are, mm. right? Mm. You know, you're controlling their capacity, capacity to dream or not dream, right? It's so a dream in English. Yeah, yeah, well, it's yeah. It's a dream in yeah, English. Well, you, in, in the, you know. And um, have a good example. Let me, t let me give you a personal example. Of, um, uh, my mother 
could not uh, read or write, but she's the one who sent me to school. So the dream of education was really hers before it became mine, right? But when I went to school, I ended up writing my books in English. Yes. So in a way, when you come to think of it, I was imprisoning her dreams. Oh. <laughs> you were, he was imprisoning. Yeah, you know, she, she went to school to dream in English. Wow. Surely not. <laughs> Right. And am I right in saying that you were punished at school uh, if you spoke in Gikuyu yeah, or if the you used... pattern of language control is the same in every system of domination. And it involves making somebody feel uncomfortable about their language. Their language is humiliated. Negativity is associated with it. And quite frankly, it begins with Scotland and with Ireland, Scotland and Ireland and Wales. Eh? It's in Wales where children were made to carry placards around their neck saying Welsh not. Either were caught speaking Welsh in the school compound. Yeah. The, in the case of the Irish, as early as when? 1593. Spencer, the poet, yes, I'm, I've met was to write, was to write the, uh, a view of... Uh, Sorry, let me just make it. I met Spender, uh, not oh, Spencer. No, no, not Spencer. You can't. <laughs> I know what you're thinking Sorry, about. please, yeah. I apologize. Spencer, it was contemporary of Shakespeare. But I think what you're saying is that you I and, got it. I just, and Shakespeare... No, no, what you're saying is... It's the same poetic imagination. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, as as 1595, I believe, he published a book called A View of Ireland at the Present Time. And here, two, he's got in two interlocutors. One is an English settler in Ireland, another is a visiting lord from London. And they're asking, why is it for 200 years we have not been able to conquer the Irish? Right? Why? And they come up with a solution, language. So if we can make them forget their language and their naming system, if we can make them, in fact, he says, if we can make them forget these marks and O's, he says it right civilly, you know, then we can make them forget who they are. Oh. So the book becomes, in fact, a program for the erasure of Irish memory of who they are. Because it's, if we can make them forget who they are, we shall conquer them. Now, the same pattern, you saw it in uh, America in relation to uh, Native Americans. Yes. Yeah. Captain Pratt who started a school for American kids, uh, Native American kids who were taken from California or from the west to the east. On the first day of arrival at this school in Carlisle, in Pennsylvania, in 1823, the children, the Indian Native American kids were given a pointer and they would point at the blackboard for some marks. Whatever they pointed, that piece of paper was pinned on their back. Mm. That was their English name. Mm. They didn't know. They were just point at any name there. Mm. <laughs> and they would point, and that would be their English name. And then they were humiliated about their Native American languages. Captain Pratt was later to say, actually, the aim of the school was to kill the Indian and save the man. Yeah. This was in 1823. Mm -hmm. And that idea of killing the native, you know, to say whatever, is really common. It was called there in India, it was there in Africa. It was there in Japan, this is Korea. Mm -hmm. When Japan colonized Korea between 1910 and 1945, the first thing they did was to impose Japanese names on Koreans right. Huh? Right. and Japanese language. Right. So the same pattern. Uh, it's a colonial thing. It's a, 
it's part of the system of uh, mental uh, do, control. Yes, yes, yeah. And mental control is part and part of political and economic control. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. When did you it, make the... In a, in a way, when you come to think of it, it's like the whole idea of making weaponizing one's own culture and language against themselves. Wow. <laughs> right? Yeah, weaponizing yeah. one's own yes, culture. Yes, well, you, you weaponize. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. Building one's own. <laughs> yeah, business. yeah. You become sort of weaponized against yourself. Oh. You know? Yeah. When did you make the decision to go into yourself and to uh, uh, to to speak uh, to write in Gikuyu only, which means that basically you turned down. I can't imagine how much financially that, that decision cost, um, or even in terms of notoriety, though you are world-renowned, um, you made the choice only to write in Gikuyu. I know Wangui from a long time ago, oh. Wangui Wagoro, oh, oh, yeah. who was the yeah. first, was she the first um, uh. Uh, tr translator of Gikuyu uh. to English for, for you? She and, was, she's yeah. all my books into it. Yeah. Into, into, and now into, there is into, somebody into, else doing, you know, and as yeah. you grow, the story yeah. must continue. Yeah. But yeah. getting back to my point, when did you make the decision that you would only write in Gikuyu, having learned, having your entire education in English? It was a radical I, act. Actually, I d okay, I like telling stories, so let me tell you this story. I want to share this story. It happened <laughs> a long time ago, actually. I think most of you are not born then, I don't, let me see. I think you are not born. I, I can go back to 1966, right? In New York. Yes. Right? And we, we have a, there's an international pen conference. I was then a student, postgraduate student at Leeds University. But I was a published author of Weep No Child, The yes. River Between. So I go to New York, I'm invited as a guest of honor from Africa. You know, they are, you know it was an international conference. Writers from the formerly communist, or from the Eastern Europe were invited. Pablo Neruda was there, and many Latin American writers were there. So you can imagine me as a young writer sitting, okay, now, okay. I, well, I don't, I, you know, young writers, but as a young writer, I'm thinking, Ah, uh, because I don't believe I'm a writer, although I published two novels. And so I'm trying to act the writer, <laughs> all right? You know, try to look somber, so it's very serious. <laughs> That's the look. I want a camera. That's the look. <laughs> right? You know, so I end up with a Socratic look, uh, uh, Socratic pose. And I think one of the, I was in one of my Socratic poses. Uh, the session was Pablo Neruda, I believe. Norman Mailer was also yep. there in that particular session. He was chairing the session and uh, the panel. And the other, Pablo Neruda was there. And an uh, Italian writer, uh, the author of uh, Bread and Wine, Ignatius Lohan. I think. And Sloan was talking, complaining about the lack of Italian translation, modern Italian writing translations into English and, say, French. He was complaining. Then he said, that, please remember this, I'm in my Socratic pose. <laughs> so I'm not hearing what you are saying. <laughs> <laughs> then I hear these words, and you know, Italian is not like one of these Bantu languages with one or two words in their vocabulary. Gone was the Socratic pose. <laughs> Africa, and I was a guest of one. They were regional guests of honor. So I was from Africa. And my Africa now is being attacked. 
as, okay? So I used to stand up and defend African languages and say they are suddenly more than two words, their vocabulary, outrage, okay? I'm taking a picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, then, to cut a long short story short, then I come back to Leeds, okay? And I was in the middle of my third novel, A Grain of Wheat. But in what language was I writing it? In English. But I just come from New York, proclaimed to the whole world that the African languages had more than two words in their vocabulary. And there I am acting out the very thing that I was complaining about. So that was a very important moment for me of agony and thinking and, yeah. But the second moment, equally important, was when I was um, in 1977, after I returned to Kenya, and I long, I'll make the long story short, then I become, I'm put in a maximum security prison uh, you can read about it in my book, Wrestling with the Devil. Yeah. I put a maximum security prison for having participated in the writing of a play to be acted by ordinary men and women of the village in my language, my mother tongue, mm. the core language. It's called I'll marry when I want. And I'm put in a maximum security prison. From being a professor, I'm a prisoner for writing in Igikoyo, right? So 1978 was a crucial year for me because the memories of New York and other things came back. Memories of history came back. Memories of colonialism came back and so on. And that's when I made the decision. In prison. In prison. In prison, in a maximum security prison, that's when I switched from English to a koyo. In other words, I said, I'm going to write in a very language which was the basis of my incarceration. And I wrote my first novel, Devil on the Cross, in a koyo language, and on, <laughs> you know what, <laughs> on toilet paper, anyway, because I didn't have any other paper in prison, yeah. So that was really when, so, the crucial year is 1978. 78. In, yeah, in a maximum security, security prison. prison. And yeah. from that day onwards, you wrote in Gikoyo? Yeah, I wrote in Gikoyo mostly. I would say mostly because some theoretical works and so on. I still write in English, but my fiction, my poetry, my drama, I now write in Gikoyo language. For this and, particular and my event? Rec my recent work, actually, was what I call Venetian poems. I went to Venice three years, three years ago, so I wrote a series of poems in Igikoyo on Venice called Venetian poems. The fact uh, that you have written, uh, dis made the decision to write uh, in Gikuyu the language uh, which you are keeping alive by doing so, yeah, yeah. Uh, that you did that in a prison, that you had that epiphany uh, as Oscar Wilde had epiphany in, when he was in prison. Um, as I, I also would like to say, I would love to have spoken to you about um, Rafiki, the film, uh, and the censorship uh, that's happening from the government towards Wanuri, yeah. the director, yeah. who brought the film here, and how your play was banned yeah, some yeah, yeah. 50 years ago. We've not got the time, I'm afraid. You but know, prison is a... An ex is a you think of prison is a symbol of confinement. You know, you are confined. You know, so you can think of prison and think of other prisons. Yes. You can think of slavery and plantation slavery actually as a prison. Yes. Uh, so you can think of many other yeah, prisons. Kinds of prisons. You can think of con becomes for me a symbol of confinement. So when in prison I use my imagination to break free of confinement. Yes. And that's how I came to think of art thereafter. Art, in a way, dreams, is a way 
of human beings breaking free of confinement. Okay? I, yes, I, yeah. You know, and the struggle, you can see, you know, all authoritarian regimes or tendencies is to suppress the arts, all the areas of imagination, because they don't like people to imagine a different world, different possibilities. But dreams always invite possibilities. Eh? The impossible is in a dream, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. No, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, the idea that the imagination is free and that it needs to be, yeah. uh, it's so, just beautiful. In fact, that's what I, okay, in fact, I do tell, in my book, uh, uh, Wrestling with the Devil, I do talk how I came to actually write the novel. And this is when I realized I'm confined in the maximum security prison with many walls, within walls, and so on. I'm not allowed to contact any contact with the outside world, not with my family, not with my friends. You can't so read on. any books. I can't read books and so on. Yeah. Then one night I realized something that actually every night I was breaking free of prison. Yeah. Yeah. Because in my, my imagination, I could walk the streets of my home. Huh? I could interact with my family. I could see them. Yes. Right? You know, minutes. So every night, every day, my mind was, could break through the walls of prison. So I came to the realization, in fact, I say this in my book, imagination became my wings of glory. Huh? Yeah. So with these wings of glory, I could oh, fly out, go through all that, and then come back. Huh? You know, you say uh, <laughs> yeah. wings of glory, and your story, yeah. Nyambura, yeah. about Nyambura, is all about uh, literally the wings of glory. Yeah, that story, it's by beautiful. the way, yeah, I wrote it for my grandchildren. Uh, uh, one of them, actually. Is Mokoma's daughter. Right. You know, right. They are friends with my son, yeah. who is also a writer, Mokoma. We have connections over there. Yeah. And um, they have. My son Mokoma has a daughter called Nyambura. And my other son, Dosho, has a, a daughter called Nyambura. And my daughter, Wajiko. And they are all writers. They have daughters called right. Nyambura because they named it after the. Mukoma's mother, right. yeah, my first wife, Nyambura. It means she who brings rain. She who brings rain. So the, the, that's what the name yeah, means. Yeah, Nyambura. And you find a mount in Zulu. In Zulu, it's called Mvula. Huh? Right. You find Mvula, Nyambura, all over Mvula. the continent. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know an Mvula yeah, from uh, South Africa. Yeah, Mvula, from, yeah. 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 It's the same name, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Nyambura. Yeah. Okay. She who brings rain, yeah. She who brings rain. Yes. So a story to you about them, you know, uh, the bringer of rain. Uh, uh, rain, yeah. And may I say that you chose a girl to be the heroine or the hero of the story, and likewise in the 1950s you uh, chose a woman, ah, I can't remember the book, but you chose a woman as the central character in, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think in more, most of my books there are, you know, Devil on the Cross. Yes, yes, Waringa, yes, actually, yes, is, yes. Is, uh, yeah. Yeah. Is, that a, is that a deliberate yeah. choice, and if so, yeah. why? But I know what you're talking about. Recently, I published another book, an epic, in the Kuyo language. Uh, it's called a Perfect Ten in English. It will be translated into English under the title The Perfect Ten. And this is what happened. Among the myth of origins of the Gikoyo community, the one I come from in Kenya. They say the original man and woman was one man, one woman, Gikoyo and Mombi. And they had nine daughters, who were actually 10. But they had no brothers. Mm -hmm. It's only when they came of marriageable age that some suitors came elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, I was in heaven when I thought, wait, wait, wait a minute. If they had no brothers until the age of marriage, mm -hmm. it means 
they were the ones who were doing all the work. Yeah? You know, they're not brothers to turn to for do this because I'm too weak or whatever. So they had know how to build, yeah. make clothes, uh, you know, uh, be, be trade, be, defend themselves, right? So make weapons of self-defense and so on. Plan, think. So I said, wait a minute, I now know I've got the story of the original feminists. <laughs> yeah. And Googie, you've yeah. taken us from yeah. Ireland and the taking of language to Native uh, Americans and the taking of their language to Kenya, to South Africa. Yeah. Um, your knowledge is, uh, is, um, is beautiful to sit next to. Um, and Gugi Wathiongo in Manchester, just across from the Free Trade Hall, where Hugh Masekela performed in the anti-apartheid oh. oh, movement, yeah. just yeah. around the corner from where there's a statue of Lincoln, where the uh, the people of Manchester uh, would not take the cotton because of the slaves, uh -huh. um, just around the corner from the Pan African Congress meeting oh. in 1945, oh, that was, very important. Um, that was at, uh, at the University of Manchester up there, just yeah. around the corner from the University of Manchester, where Arthur Lewis was the first black um, uh, black uh, lecturer in in the history of Britain um, and although we only call ourselves by the color of our skin when we're in the minority uh, oh. um, just around all of that in the Albert Hall from me to you and I'd like you to take a picture and hashtag it please because I want to remember this on Twitter yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 I really do I just want to as as um, as a, as a writer myself, as a Mancunian, as an Ethiopian, which is right yeah, next Ethiopia to your country. Yeah, important for Pan-Africanism, remember? Yes, it is. The Organization yes. of Africa Unity yes. in yeah, Addis Ababa. Right. Yeah. And Krumah came to the first and one. Krumah was there. Jomo Kenyatta from Kenya was there. Yes, yes. Uh, du Bois was there. Yes. From, uh, you know, I mean, so as they were there at the Pan-African Congress here yeah, in Manchester. Manchester. The, Actually, you are right. Manchester is very, very important. See? For the African imagination or imaginary. Yes. Yes. I'm just going to touch on I that to end the talk and to say, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm round yeah. of applause yeah. for Ngugi Wa Thiongo. Oh, thank you. Mm.